Hi, Steve. I'm very happy to be here with you. How have you been? Hola. I've been very, very good. And I'm looking forward to our uh, conversation. Great. Steve, I just want to say you are considered one of the most influential psychologists in history. You started, well, to develop this kind of evidence-based consciousness movement. How do you feel with that? Well, I don't like thinking about it in a self-focused way, but I'm part of a tradition, you know, and I'm part of a behavior analytic, functional analytic, functional contextual tradition. And that tradition has, well, in more recent history has been marginalized and even was declared dead for goodness sakes. Very, very easy to find major psychologists saying it's dead and buried. Uh, I think the rumors of our death has uh, uh, got a little bit ahead of itself because um, this wing, I think, is, is doing quite well. So I feel very, very good about the fact that the things that really held back a full functional contextual approach, which I believe were two major things. Uh, one was uh, not being able to get over the hump of language and cognition. Uh, and the other was not being very good at making friends. Um, and some of that's personality. Some of it is that behavioral thinking was very mar marginal to begin with. And so, the, for example, in Skinner's lab, they had a, a phrase, we few, we happy few. You know, you think about the little rebel bands, you know, or us against the world. Well, maybe that's fine in 1940. It's not fine now. I don't want to be we few. I want to be we many, but not by just going mainstream, right? So I've dedicated my life to uh, getting over those two things. The most painful one in terms of making friends was the almost ridiculous situation in which behavior analytic thinking was used as the archetype of anti-evolutionary thinking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When um, the wing I'm out of was viewed itself as a part of evolutionary science. And uh, Skinner's last dying words were about variation and selection and its importance. Right. So, which is very sad, isn't it? I mean, to, to have the people you think should be your friends be your enemies. This is uh, something's wrong. And I think we've been able to correct those in the work in contextual behavioral science. But it's not just me. I think the way we've been able to correct it, and I've had a role, is to try to clear away the underbrush that made it hard for people to see what was really inside this tradition and what it was really about. And uh, that's taken some moves that I've sometimes taken criticism from by my behavioral colleagues. But in the long run, I think it's proven itself to be useful of being able to use middle level terms, develop a reticulated research program that's not just bottom up, but involves applied people, even in basic uh, questions and developing basic principles. And that uh, aggressively does, aggressively is a funny word for it, assertively does outreach and builds bridges to people who disagree with us, having a, a conversation out to people who should be our friends and don't know to be our friends. So that's how I feel about it. I feel like um, okay. I've had some small role, but the communities have an even bigger role in healing some breaches and then getting over some of those barriers. And the end result is, you know, if you had to say an evidence-based therapy, where are some areas where there's a lot of vitality, I would say third wave act and now process-based therapy. I, I, I think you'd say that. And, um, and, and yet they all have the fingerprints of uh, functional contextual behavior and other thing. And a little bit now starting also even in language and cognition. It's certainly true with uh, behavior analysts, but it's beginning to be true. You're beginning to see it even with some cognitive folks, Jan de Hauer, people like that, who 
say, and this is very interesting. You know, this is really is dealing good. seriously with the issues we care about. There is. Longer uh, answer than you probably I, hope for, but uh, <laughs> that's I feel how I you. Feel. I feel you. So thank you for sharing. Um, life on therapy is a journey and work in progress. Uh, for the human being therapist, um, how relevant is personal work as a therapist? I mean, personal supervision. Well, I think it's central. Uh, it's central because, especially in this way, uh, this work is built on the psychology of the normal. This work says, you know, when people suffer, when they get stuck, when they get in a cul-de-sac, it's not because they're doing something typically that's weird, strange, odd, etc. It's not because people are broken or there's something wrong with their brains or not. Of course, those things do happen. I mean, people do have brain injury. People do have mm -hmm. abnormal processes occur. But in the main, mm -hmm. what we call abnormal psychology is anything but abnormal. It's actually based on processes and principles that are shared by everybody, virtually everybody. I think dominantly a clash between learning systems that are a thousand times older than the ones that we're reflecting right now in this verbal exchange. And so we as human beings have been riding this tiger of language and cognition that's only a couple hundred thousand to a couple million years old. And in evolutionary time scale, that's nothing. It's nothing. It's an eye blink. It's nothing. And operant and classical conditioning is half a billion years old. And habituation is older than that. And some of the things that are involved in our underlying neurobiology and so forth are even older than that. So uh, we're young. We're, we're a species that uh, is still learning. And if you're going to push the edges and say, these principles, these processes are important for you in helping to deal with suffering, but also to promote your prosperity. If it doesn't apply to you as a therapist, why are you saying that? I mean, how dare you say that? And so that's one. And the other part is you're not going to be able to lean in when it's hard to do what's difficult with a client. If you yourself are avoiding clinging, uh, you don't have decent attentional flexibility, et cetera. Doesn't mean you have to be like, the master of the act universe you know i'm i'm some glorious psychologically flexible person no i mean for goodness <laughs> sake i certainly am not that ask my wife <laughs> but I, i'd say people you know the reason this is so important to me and i focus on it so much is i'm so bad at it you know so you as a therapist when you're able to see that these things apply to you and they're helpful, it's a lot easier to go eye to eye to somebody and say, really, let's look at this and you know, let's walk into the hell of your own history. Not because I'm a sadist or you're a masochist, not to wallow, but because there's things to learn inside the areas where your mind has said, look away, look away, look away. No, no, let's go there. Let's use the reverse compass and uh, do something truly new. Because if you keep doing what you've been doing, you'll keep getting what you've been getting. And you came to me wanting something different. Well, let's do something different. And that might mean deliberately taking the lid off and looking inside. Uh, some of the areas that uh, you habitually dismiss or hope you don't have to deal with or put off for another day or try to talk yourself into how it's okay if you live a more limited life that doesn't go there. You may not get to decide that. That limited life may become even more limited because you keep saying no instead of saying yes to your own life. So... It's very important. Terrific. And it's not by accident. If you're going to get training in ACT, you come to a, a you know, a world conference that there's, you know, ACBS, Association for Contextual Behavioral Science, almost certainly one of the first things that will happen is they'll be doing experiential exercises on, for, and with you. 
because that's the way we train it. Um, so, and there's a reason for it, the one that I've just explained. And at the end, the foolies. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. Uh, do you think that today's society promotes self-awareness? Yes. And in some positive ways, I think, but also in some negative ways. Um, especially, I think we as a society have to realize that we're living inside a cultural tradition that's about 150 years old that didn't exist before that, which is using uh, behavioral science to develop categorical concepts that apply, that are applied to individuals. You know, this begins, well, but it begins with Kettle A measuring the chests of uh, Scottish soldiers in the early 1800s and saying, here's the average soldier and we need average soldiers and sort of worshiping average. And then takes a dark turn with Galton who says, no, 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 don't worship the average worship the tips of the distribution. Mm -hmm. he, de he developed standard deviations and all of that to focus on that. So inside these normative categories, self-awareness has turned into awareness of the categories you're in. What is your personality type? Do you take you to Myers-Briggs? Are you an internalizer? How, what is your percentile on IQ? Are you in special, are you in gifted and talented class? Do you, you know, the problem is these normative categories put a top people, which also includes what disorder do you have? Are you BPD? Do you have PTSD? I mean, just listen to the language. Do you have, and then here's a category. You know, are you inside the category? Well, turns out uh, those normative categories don't predict individual behavior. They do not. And not only that, do they not? They cannot. They're based on a mathematical error that's classical physics, statistical physics has known for over a hundred years. But it's everywhere, it's everywhere, it's everywhere. It's in all of your medical diagnosis and your psychological diagnosis and your personality and your school placement, your work placement, it's just everywhere. So um, I'll take a little bit to unpack what that means. It, it's uh, things I've become more focused on as I've gotten into process-based therapy and realized that processes of change cannot ever be identified using normative statistical means because they violate one of the fundamental assumptions of the statistics. It's a longer story. But um, real self-awareness is something more like this. What are the processes that have supported me in my life? What are the things that I do, the micro things that I do that lead me forward? And the things that I do that lead me backward towards what I really want? What are the circumstances in which I step forward? What are the circumstances in which I step backward? If I can bring my awareness to that, can I then bring my uh, ability to make choices to that and begin to choose to do things that take me forward even when the culture is saying, oh, no, no, don't do that. And when my own kind of automatic thinking processes say, no, 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 don't do that. That's real self-awareness. That's that process of peeling back the onion, seeing to deeper truth, and just keep doing that over and over again. I do think we are headed towards that for this reason. Mm -hmm. Young people, not people as old as I am, but, you know, I mean, people who are more in their early 20s and earlier have grown up in a world in which having it their own way is natural. And it's beginning to undermine the hegemony of normal put atop people. By the way, I should say, for dirty purposes, the reason why Galton developed those standard deviation 
was in order to identify who should be allowed to breed. He's the father of eugenics. That's who that guy is. Carl Pearson, the Pearsons are your correlation, was a professor of not statistics, not mathematics, eugenics. R.A. Fisher, Fisher Z, Frank Yates, Yates Correction, on and on it goes. Eugenics. So we're living inside these dirty categories that were designed in, to be about individual differences, which was not about the individual, but it was about the differences so that you could go to the tips of the distribution and allow those people to breed. And down here, you say, no, 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 you, you can't even have children. Every state in the union in the United States of America pre allowed states to sterilize people if their IQs were uh, below a, a couple standard deviations, to sterilize people. And not just for that reason. You know, people who are gay could be sterilized. And think about it. Now we would say, oh, that's a human rights abuse. Some of these laws are still on the books and not enforced. But that's how recent they are. Yeah. And that's just my country. I bet you the same because I know it's true in Europe. So coming back, what we need are concepts that inform individuals how to have it your own way. And young people know that. That's why they don't want to just have he and she. People don't want he and she. There's a whole lot of people who are not he or she. That's been true for a long time. It just wasn't noticed because you weren't even allowed to say it out loud. And I'm old enough to remember. You couldn't even say it out loud if you were non-binary. Mm -hmm. And um, people don't want necessarily to be in this party or that, to this religion or that. You know, the single most fastest growing religious affiliation is none of the above. Among young people. Not about older people. They're still holding on to I'm this and you're that and my religion's better than yours or whatever. So I am looking forward to the day when psychological science catches up with where the young people are going and gives them the tools to individualize, but not in a selfish way, to individualize in a way that empowers relationship, cooperation, connection, community, because we have to figure out how to deal with immigration, with a world where you're aware of what's happening around the world 24 seven, where climate change is something that we all need to step up to, where um, religious differences and differences due to ethnicity and language and so forth need to be dealt with in a new and creative way. We, we have to step up to that. And the we is not gonna be me, it's not gonna be old people because they're not going to move fast enough. It's going to be people your age and younger. Really strong. Thank you. Um, what is third wave CVT and emergency of process-based approach? I missed the first few words. <clears throat> what do you want to know about third wave and process-based? Would you say, what is, what is the first few words you asked? Yeah, what is third wave CVT? What is it? Or just what is it? <laughs> Well, third wave became kind of a collection and amalgam. I was the first to use the term, but I viewed it as a transformational change occurring across the different wings of evidence-based therapy, but especially the behavioral and cognitive tradition. And you, I just said out loud what was happening and gave it a, a label. It was happening inside the behavioral wing, things like DBT, it was happening inside the cognitive wing with things like MBCT, metacognitive therapy, uh, to some degree behavioral activation in the behavioral wing. And it was a combination of things, a willingness to look at our underlying assumptions, a willingness to go into deeper clinical and human questions, a willingness to consider input from traditions that were outside of the cognitive behavioral traditions, uh, uh, narrowly defined, an interest in processes of change, a skepticism about uh, 
protocols for syndromes. Uh, an interest in the whole person and in the prosperity of the individual, not just sort of fixing people. And an interest in principles and processes, methods that apply to the clinician as well as the client. Those are the defining features, I think. And what, you know, that wave was a received resistance and so forth because people are afraid it would wash everything away. Well, I'm old enough to have seen the shift from the first wave to the second wave. It didn't wash everything away. The behaviorists, you know, I mean, I would remember walking through the halls when Tim Beck would give talks and huge numbers were there, or Mike Mahoney or whatever, and being a little shocked because I, I'm a behavior analyst, I'm a card carrying behaviorist. But it didn't wipe away behavioral thinking. It didn't. Uh, for one thing, the evidence maintained the importance of some of these things. For another thing, behavioral thinking evolved. For another thing, some of the issues that were inside traditional cognitive thinking uh, became, over time, became more clear. Okay. I mean, one reason I moved so strongly in an act direction, and part of that was my personal experience. I told that story on my TEDx talk with my own panic disorder. And finding that only when I turned back to my hippie hill training as a hippie, uh, you know, out of California, summer of love, the whole nine yards, did I find traction on my own panic disorder. And I was fascinated by that. Uh, uh, but, you know, it, was, it, it wasn't just that. It was, uh, uh, you know, that we tested in my lab in seven, di seven different studies, uh, the underlying cognitive model in CBT. Okay. We did a component analysis. This is way before Neil Jacobson's dismantling studies. Very small, poorly done, but what a pro an assistant professor could do. We did process analyses and the very first ACT study uh, has a mediational analysis that came from it. Well, this is 1986. I mean, the whole concept of mediational analysis started in 1986, you know, with, uh, with the causal steps uh, uh, work, uh, uh, identifying mediation is important. Mm -hmm. So what I'm saying here is, you know, I didn't light my hair on fire, then I had hair to do that and say, oh, we're going to tear down the house. No, I had a personal experience, moved in a direction, it got some traction, we did some randomized trials, only published one, but the other ones in the file drawer, not because they had bad outcomes, but precisely because they had good outcomes and we weren't ready to say why. And I did a series of studies in my lab showing that cognitive therapy did not work based on the cognitive model. Now we pretty much know that now in big meta-analyses, classic CT, meaning detect, challenge, dispute, and change your thoughts is not a powerful technology. Why? Because it's very close, very close to suppressive problems. It's not meant to suppress, but it has that effect. And people, you just ask your clients, I tried CBT, it didn't work. What did you try? I tried to get rid of those thoughts. Oh my God. You did what? I tried to get rid of, they told me, they taught me. No. Well, if they taught you that, that's a fool's errand because thoughts don't go away. There's no delete button in your nervous system. If you've had a crazy bad thought, if you've had mother tell you horrible things like you're a rotten apple, I wish I never had you. If you abused, that's in your history forever, short of brain injury. That's it. It's in your history forever. It's in your brain forever. There's no belief button. That's not why, because we're historical beings. Our history gives us wisdom, and that's why we're able to avoid being eaten by tigers, but it also means we can remember that rape, we can remember that abuse, we can remember that betrayal, we can remember that shameful thing we did yeah, forever. But, and I'll try to lay on the plane more quickly. Maybe these talk, these answers should be shorter. <laughs> I think it was interesting. Um, may I ask you again what this third way? Yeah. Just ask me again, and I'll, and I'll try to do a shorter answer. Okay. Well, let's let's move forward. Uh, according to your last paper, which is really good, psychological processes of change can be organized into six dimensions: cognition, effect, tension, self, 
motivation and over behavior. Me just playing a bit more on their interaction. Yeah, we've come to that way of thinking, not so much because we're making an ontological claim that there's any hard division between these categories, but when we've done a meta-analysis on processes of change, of what are the sequences that lead people in a positive direction, we were able to, to score basically that entire world's literature on processes of change using those six categories. And then the additional levels, those are all psychological categories, the additional levels of biophysiological and sociocultural factors. And then we put it into a system where we look at healthy variation, selection of uh, successful uh, steps within those dimensions, retention of them, and fitting them to context. So you have variation, selection, retention, and context across those six levels and those those six dimensions of psychology and those two additional levels at higher and lower levels of organization. That allows us to really take the everything we know on processes of change and put them into a system. And why would that be important? Because I think we're moving, and this was one of the deep purposes of the third wave, we're moving towards uh, a new definition of evidence-based therapy as targeting the biopsychosocial processes, the actual small sequences that people do with kernels, not entire packages that will help the, the person move forward. Looking at a person as a complex network with everything from genes to their culture and everything in between intertwined in a dynamical system. And we uh, conceptually are moving there. We now are moving there with our measures. We have measures that focus on this uh, extended evolutionary meta model. We vetted those measures, not by psychometrics because they violate the ergodic theorem, which is the problem of putting normative categories at top people, but using more single items and high density longitudinal uh, experience sampling style of a measurement. And we've been able, because of that, to begin to come up with a, an, a functional uh, analytic approach that's empirical rather than just conceptual. And if we can actually get there, we'll have a new diagnostic system. And we're not very far away, we think. We'll know within a year or two. And the we are the process-based therapy people, the ACT people, the other uh, forms of process-based CBT. And uh, that's the journey you're on right now. It's a very exciting uh, uh, way of developing knowledge that's individually focused, scaled to normative principles, but only because they help you see the individual even more clearly. Okay. And that's quite different than uh, what Galton was encouraging and what we've lived inside with our Oh, you have major depression. Excuse me. What the heck even is that? In the STAR-D trial with 3,700 persons in this largest trial ever done on major depression, and it will never be done again because nobody wants to fund these things, there were 1,100 different kinds of depression and among 3,700 people. And 50% of the people had a pattern that was so rare, only four other people had it. You know, another four out of 4,000, that's a category? No, it's not. That's nonsense. So we better figure out how to deal with the individual clinically and empower the clinician to do that with, with what we're calling idiomic concepts instead of normative concepts that, tell, that are based on the individual and their trajectories, but that can be applied to many individuals but not by blurring the individual, rather by seeing them even more clearly, like having a really well polished lens where now I can see, oh, you have a wart, see, or you have a, an age spot, you know, like that. That's what we want. There are concepts that help us see the person, not that blur the person. And that's fundamentally different than what we've been doing inside evidence-based therapy. Marvelous. 
Um, forgive my diversity, but I want to keep building bridges in the community and be inclusive from a procedural and philosophical foundation. In a sense, I see avoidance and a kind of perspective taking as a key processes in other models. Um, I remember your paper, Making Sense of Spirituality, uh, for example, Beck and distancing with thoughts, even Freud, um, quite unreflecting self-observation. Uh, what bring me to what are the common points between ACT and other models, Buddhism, Gestalt, existential approach? Well, I think the overlap, when you get to process, okay. is such that any evidence-based method is going to overlap. If the model is sufficiently good, now think about it this way. Suppose I'm telling you right now that we did the entire world's literature, we looked at all the processes of change that were working, and we could sort them all into those six psychological dimensions, the two additional levels of analysis, and focusing on variation, selection, retention, and context. Well, ACT has been at that game for a long time. Those six dimensions of affect, cognition, attention, sense of self, motivation, overt behavior, have to do with acceptance and non-clinging, diffusion and cognitive flexibility, attentional uh, flexibility with flexible, fluid, and voluntary attention to the now from a witnessing, noticing, I hear now sense of self with values motivating you and the deliberate construction of values-based habits through committed action. So that doesn't mean that everything everybody's doing is act. I'm just saying we've been at this process-based game for a long time. And there were, there's more uh, mediational analyses and process analyses and component analyses and so forth inside the ACT tradition than any other in psychotherapy. I'm sorry for saying it in such a grand way. But when you dig down to that and you start thinking in this broader way, you, re you realize, and of course we realized it early on, that many of, these other, many of the other traditions and basically all of them that work, if you have a Catholic and model with a small c catholic one that's meant to be universal it should overlap because we're not trying to create little wings you know that are different there's no interest in saying let's have something that's really different no let's have something that's really powerful and let's use what moves people so you know the first name for act was comprehensive distancing uh, it sounded dissociative. We got rid of it. But of course, it was a shout out to Beck. Distancing is his concept. Now, in Beck's approach, you back up, you observe, you notice there's that self-awareness thing. And then you're able to do a better job of challenging and changing those thoughts. But that happens later on. The early part is to notice, to record, do a thought record, etc maybe even have behavioral homework exercises that challenge some of these things before any cognitive correction. And people are already responding positively in traditional Beckian therapy by session two and three before there's any challenging and changing of thoughts. Well, coming at it as an ACT person, we call it comprehensive distancing, thinking maybe that's the really most important thing of the whole thing and we should lay that foundation down and build on it not to get to challenging and changing because we're too worried as act people against the possible suppressive and avoidant avoidant based things that could come in there uh, so the pick something else it would take cbt you're going to find all those dimensions in different ways uh, and you can borrow from them. I'll, I'll give you an example, reappraisal. Is reappraisal thinking the right thought instead of the wrong thought? No, it's not. It's sometimes cast that way, and it's a very ineffective way to cast it. What reappraisal is, is being able to think different thoughts, a broad enough range of thoughts that you can focus on what's useful and leave the rest. And how do I know that? Because if you put in measures of cognitive flexibility, diffusion, 
you know, of your ability to, to generate alternatives, those will mediate the impact of reappraisal on positive outcomes. So we want reappraisal in there, meaning thinking in broad and flexible ways that you can then fit to the demands of the situation and what you're trying to produce in your life. Well, but that's different than detect, challenge, dispute, and change. But frankly, not many CBTers nowadays in the modern world want to say they're really, yeah, but I'm old enough to remember that it, there was lots of people saying yes, very clearly, detect, challenge, dispute, and change. I mean, uh, Albert Ellis had it in there as the A, B, C, D, and the D was dispute. You had to dispute. No, you don't have to dispute. You need to think, if what you mean is, you know, argue and fight, no, no, that's wrong. No, you don't have to do that. You need to think more broadly. Don't just enter into one thought. Think more broadly. Well, that's a good thing. So uh, here's my message. Let me do one more example. I know it's a long answer. I promised to do short, but here I am. Thank you. I do, I do rants. Um, take something like gestalt therapy. Gestalt therapy, oh, that's very different. Oh, that's not, there's lots of evidence on gestalt therapy. Hello, the modern version of motion focused therapy, very nice randomized trial, Les Greenberg, Sue Johnson, come on. You can't say we're evidence-based and say, but we don't want that. We can't do that. It's not fair. Or Peter Fonagy with mentalization, et cetera. How would you think about processes like mentalization? Perspective taking, let's say, in Gestalt therapy or EFT. Mm -hmm. put, your, put this resistant part of you in the chair there. Let's have a conversation. Perspective taking, yeah. Also has a little diffusion business in there. We're now gonna hear the voice, even of other parts of you, yourself as a child, internal family systems, on and on it goes. So the short version of your answer to your question is, any evidence-based therapy has to work through processes that matter. No evidence-based therapist should be forced to say, because of the, the label and the school and your heroes, you only get to deal with these processes, not those processes. I'm sorry, they're evidence-based, but you can't go there because they aren't inside our school. I say, no, <laughs> I say F to that. Everything is on the table, everything you can do. That doesn't mean eclecticism, exact opposite. If you're gonna be that open, you better have a system. And it turns out psychological flexibility expanded a bit. For example, it's not just cognitive diffusion, it's also reappraisal, meaning cognitive flexibility. That still is a form of psychological flexibility. Emotion, it's not just acceptance, it's also not clinging. Why? Hanging on to something is a form of avoidance, number one. Number two, it has effects that are just as powerful. Not having this versus having only this has effects that are just as harmful because they narrow down. So variation, healthy variation, selection, retention, and context is important. What are all the processes that talk about healthy variation? So what I'm busy doing right now with process-based therapy is expanding the psychological flexibility model. Because I've always thought ACT was nothing more than just techniques that helped you move psychological flexibility. Mm -hmm. And we have a major paper coming out in behavior research and therapy next year that will make this argument. Stefan Hoffman's on it, classic second wave CBT person who's become very third wavy, Joe Sorochi, others. And, uh, I want to bust the walls down. Let's, how about if evidence-based therapy gets to go wherever the data takes them? What a concept. I think that's our future. But inside an idiomic vision that empowers our ability to work with individuals, 
and you see them clearly. No fuzzy normative concepts like from the DSM and the rest of that nonsense. Right. Thank you. According with this speech's evolution uh, and our three brains in context, uh, do you think that we use our intuition? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, intuition is a way of speaking about the other sources of behavioral regulation other than analytic, judgmental, temporal, predictive, uh, symbolic thought. And the vast majority of what we're doing is being influenced by things we have no conscious aware and no awareness of and no uh, involvement with in that way. Sometimes it's still verbal, but not in that way. For example, we have the capacity to observe, describe, and appreciate. That mode of mind, which is very important to poetry, to literature, to movies, and so to music, uh, dance, very important, still symbolic, still verbal in that sense, no longer analytic, judgmental, problem-solving, predictive. It's observe, describe, and appreciate. Um, and then there's a whole nother, and th those become kind of intuitive. Very difficult for, let's say, an artist to really say fully. They'll say some. And usually in metaphor, in poetry, in imagery, it's still symbolic, but it's not the kind of technical terms you're used to in a problem solving set. And then it blends down to things that you learn by experience. Well, those learning processes are a thousand times older. They're very, very important. Operant classical conditioning, habituation, all those things are operating. And not just that, our underlying neurobiology you know, the reptilian vagal system versus the mammalian vagal system, let's say a polyvagal theory. That's a real thing. That's happening. And you're not consciously aware of that. You don't know that you've activated something that's starting to shut down your system in a very reptilian way, like freezing and everything's being downregulated. And even your heart rate is slowing not because you're calm, precisely because you're threatened, you know? Uh, so uh, I think we need to, uh, as evidence-based therapists, to not be quite so mindy. It's not all this problem-solving stuff. Some of that needs to be fostered. Some of that needs to be reined in. You observe, describe, and appreciate. Well, it's not just the meditators and third wave people, Michelle Krask, others, you know, exposure works in part by having names for emotions, being able to observe and describe what your body is doing. That's great. And then you get into things that are more like, you know, having just the capacity to feel mm -hmm. some of the things that the more body focused or emotion focused folks are doing. And ACT actually shares that we have quite a number of body and emotion focused methods and that's expanding not contracting so uh, i say yes to your question that's yeah, a very important part of human functioning it needs to be an important part of the therapy work that we do difficult to do science about it but it's not impossible okay thank you um how can we prevent and buffer human suffering Foster healthy processes. Um, don't just think of our job as fixing, well, we're sitting there, hardly ever think of our jobs as fixing people, but don't think of our jobs just of alleviating human suffering. Think of our job as promoting human prosperity. Start early. Don't do it by telling people, do it by showing people, do it by training, do it by uh, opening up people. I think, for example, the things we're doing with mindfulness work in schools is a good idea. It's not going to prevent everything, but it gives a little corner skill that someday may be needed. I think some of the things that are in our culture, take something like emotional openness. Uh, if you um, watch a Disney movie and you're a kid, 
you know, with things like frozen, et cetera, you may get good training on emotional openness. Uh, one of the more popular songs out of uh, children's shows, a show, a, a show called Steven's Universe, ironically enough, and it actually was related to me in an interesting way, so not just by name. There's a song there called Here Comes a Thought. Google it, go look. It's been looked at by children, something like, by the time you look at the different variants that are out there, 20 million times. 20 million times, all right? Okay. It's an act song. Deliberately, the person who wrote it, actually, if you go to the website for Stevens Universe, you'll find a little thing saying that this was done linked to the work uh, in uh, psychological flexibility. And the, uh, the very first line of the, of the song is flexibility, love, and trust. And it's a... Uh, it's funny that Stephen, uh, the cartoon character, wore, wore a bald wig in the episode, apparently as a shout out to yours truly. So that's kind of cool. I haven't been able to reach the author of the song and find out if that's really true. But never mind whether it really is. So it, it, uh, it, it, I think it did come out of the act work, but even if it didn't, it's so act consonant. What I'm saying to you, it's in the culture. Our artists are on to it. Our musicians are onto it. Our movie makers are onto it. You know, I'm in the closing credits of uh, Revolver from Guy Ritchie. You know, Guy Ritchie gave away copies of Get Out of Your Mind Into Your Life to people on his Christmas list. I mean, the psychologists move the culture. They do at their best, but not by they themselves moving it. You move the people who know how to move the culture. And, and many of those are not the head shrinkers. They can't talk in normal language. They're the people who write stories, the people who sing songs, the people who show movies. So um, I think uh, our job is to promote human prosperity. If we stop thinking so narrowly about mental illness and God help us, this horrible thing, idea of mental illness as a latent disease. No, it's not. Human suffering is not a disease, latent or otherwise. It's as common as dirt. Everybody knows something about human suffering. It's a human condition. So let's dig down to doesn't mean there aren't special and abnormal things. If you have brain injury and so forth, things can happen. I'm not saying that, but don't be thinking you're destigmatizing by labeling. You are not. People climb inside those clown suits and they can never get out. Don't expect anything of me. I have BPD. And I'm like, what? What? Oh, I have PTSD. What? Don't be using that as a thing of you should take your future and go from here and pull it here and say, oh, I only have a little future. That's destigmatizing? No, it isn't. It's just another form of stigma. You know, and we've done that to the chronically mental ill. Oh, you have auditory hallucinations. Do you know how common those things are? There are people who win Nobel prizes who have auditory hallucinations. So what are we doing putting people in mental hospitals and locking the key? just because they admit they hear voices. That's insanity. It is. So I want to find a way to empower human beings, including human beings who have odd experiences, including human beings who are, you know, are different, and find a way for them to be part of our community in a way that indigenous peoples know how to do and we forgot how to do in the modern world. And we take people who are different and we put them in the corner or lock them up into rooms or put them in special facilities or hide them from public view. This is shameful. If we do that, we will prove ourselves relevant in a way that people yearn for. And in this era of COVID, they've realized, oh my goodness, maybe we need to work on our mental strength and mental flexibility, just like we work on our physical strength and physical flexibility. We don't wait until we have a disease and then say, oh, I guess we need to exercise. We do that in grade school and our 
physical education classes. Why not the same thing with our mental strength and flexibility? Well, that's starting to happen. And if it's not driven by categories, oh, please don't turn into that. Let's have depression day. Uh, you know what that is. That's code for how many people can we put on meds, yeah. including children? You know, you show me the data that's helpful, but not that meds can't be helpful for depression. They can, they can, but not the way we're doing it now where, you know, insane amount of chemicals are going into, you know, one out of four women last year in the United States of America were on antidepressants. That's insanity. So we've got a big agenda to us and, it, and it's the old Skinnerian from rats to Walden too. It's, we, you know, we need highly high precision, high scope principles that give people the tools they can use to create the kind of life prosperity that they yearn for. Thank you, because you're That's doing it right now with this uh, conversation. Uh, That's the hope. And that's one reason I say yes. When you say, will you come to the podcast? I say yes. Why? Because what you're doing is a little amplifier. Yeah. It's yes. like a megaphone. That's who knows who will listen? It's important. That's why I write books like that. Book over my shoulder. <laughs> you know, it took 10 years to write. I could write two or three academic books in the time it took me to write that one. But occasionally I want to talk directly to, it was very hard for me to do. I had to have a professional writer work with me, et cetera, to be able to, to make myself write in a way that normal people can read because I'm a geek, but. <laughs> I love your book. The liberation. Some of what we need to do. Some of what we need to do is how to talk to the culture. Yeah. And now I've got Frozen song in my mind. Let it go. Let it go. There you go. There you go. <laughs> Great. Yeah, well, the, the last question, because I know that you are very busy, um, yeah. is about the therapeutic alliance uh, mediates outcomes. We have to touch patients' heart, um, hands, and head. How relevant is it on clinical outcomes and how we can improve it? For example, self revelation, being vulnerable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like you did in your TEDx talk. Uh, the Therapeutic Alliance is, I think, important because it's a model of healthy psychological processes in relationship. And if you look at the, the evidence for the Therapeutic Alliance, it fits that interpretation. If you view it that way, you realize, no, it's not the only uh, curative and helpful way. I mean, after all, when you read a book, there's the therapeutic alliance. And I know some people in that wing say, oh, it's still there. Oh, please, come on. Don't be telling me that I'm in a relationship to a book. I mean, come on. Don't. Of course, there's a writer, I understand. But don't defend the importance of the therapeutic alliance by having it expand to mean everything that is verbal, for example. That doesn't make any sense. Um, but uh, so it's not everything, because we know the books, the movies, et cetera can have a big impact. Of course they can. The apps, the websites can have a big impact. Yes, they can. We know that. And we know the elements of them. It matters what's in them. We know that too. We also know that almost all uh, forms of direct person-to-person -person intervention will be mediated to some degree by properly, properly crafted questions about the relationship between the, the person seeking services and the person providing them. But why does that matter? In the ACT world, we have a pretty clear answer and we have pretty good evidence that it matters because the therapeutic alliance, when it's done well, the kind that actually facilitate outcomes, model process, healthy processes of change. They model psychological flexibility. And it's very easy when I'm asked this question to show what the data show, uh, which is think of somebody who transformed your life in a powerful way, a coach, a teacher, a therapist, whom, whatever. And I'll just ask you quickly six questions. When you were with that person, did you feel accepted for who you really are? 
were you constantly being judged or somehow was that not a central focus? When they were with you, were they there with you or were they only half there looking at their watch waiting for this interaction to end? When your eyes met, was it pretty clear there's two human beings connected here who are sort of sharing this time for a common purpose? Did your values matter to that person or would they override your values and ask you to do things that were really unacceptable to you? Did they care about that? And could you be together in a way that fit the opportunities of the situation? If something happened, there's a possibility. Were you able to go with the flow or was it always rigid and done in a particular way determined by the other person? Well, I know the answers to those six questions because you would not be empowered, uplifted, and moved by somebody who was judgmental, not accepting of you, only half there, who wasn't in a relationship with you, who would override what you cared about deeply and always had to do it their way, regardless of the situation. If you did that, you feel disempowered. You wouldn't feel empowered. Well, what does that mean? It means when you pick somebody who empowered you, you pick somebody who modeled psychological flexibility because those six questions are the six questions that dances around the hexagon or goes across those rows of the extended evolutionary meta model. What does that mean? It should mean that if you put in measures of psychological flexibility with your client, measures of the working alliance or however you're measuring the therapeutic alliance, that yes, the therapeutic alliance may mediate change, but if you allow them to compete, psychological fixability changes in the client is even more important. Why? Because this is a means to an end. The therapeutic alliance is not an end in itself. You're not gonna marry your clients. You're not taking them home. They're not gonna live in your basement. This is a means to an end. And often it's not even clear how you produce the means. Therapists who are good at it have good outcomes. Yeah, great. How about if you're bad at it? You're supposed to quit through your profession? When I ask this question to people, I say, how many people think it's important? In a workshop, 99% of the therapists raise their hand. How many people think they're pretty good at creating powerful working alliances? 95% of the people raise their hand. How many think people think that all the therapists are above average. And then they start giggling. You see the problem? Either I've got the extraordinary group in my workshop, or if I have the usual range of clinicians, half of the people are, are deluding themselves. They're below average in creating working alliances. Half the therapists are below average. Hello. By definition, which category are you in? Most people think, because I care about it, that means I'm in the upper category. That's nonsense. All therapists say that the working alliance is important, virtually all, high 90s percent wise. But they don't know how to produce it. And frankly, often in the work uh, on the therapeutic alliance, they're not given good answers. Now, with feedback informed therapy, where you get measures of the working alliance, that may help. Looks like it does. But if we're going to do that, how about this? When you do multiple mediator models with psychological flexibility on the client, those changes tend to eat the variance in the therapeutic alliance. Often it will be driven to non significance as a mediator. We should not be distressed about this because every clinician will tell you. If you don't learn from this relationship and take it home to the rest of your life, it's not going to matter. You have to internalize it, right? Wouldn't almost all clinicians say that? What that means is if you measure the internalization, it should eliminate the importance of the therapeutic alliance, not because it's unimportant, but because its job was to get it to be internalized. You with me on this? Yeah, yeah. So if my interpretation is right, measures of psychological flexibility in the client should eliminate the, the uh, mediational power of the working alliance. And, the, and then the two, two or three studies that's been done so far pretty well inside the ACT uh, 
uh, trials, that's what's happened, exactly what's happened. And I can give you the references if you're interested. So precisely because it's important, we better tell clinicians how to produce it. And if you're listening and you're a clinician, here's how to produce it. Work on your own psychological flexibility. Learn how to move the psychological flexibility of your clients and target them and use it and target them using methods in the therapeutic session itself that are themselves psychologically flexible. If you're ever tempted to do something like say to a client when you're working on diffusion, you shouldn't be so fused. Just shut up. We're not going to use fusion as a process in the relationship to produce diffusion in the client. Diffuse yourself from that thought that you ought to be great at producing diffusion, target diffusion, and target in a way that is itself diffused, not in a way that's judgmental and critical of the client. That's an example of fusion, not diffusion. How about if you say something like this? That's really hard for me to hear. I have thoughts like, oh my God, I don't know what to do. I tell you what, you know, I'll make room for those thoughts if you make room for yours and let's see if we can find a way to actually step forward to do what you asked me here to do, even with our thoughts, my self-doubts, your self-judgments. That happens, that's human beings. Can we kind of put them both over there and come back and work on what are you gonna do? You see what I'm doing? If I actually did that, I'm using the, 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 the self-disclosure as a means of amplifying the target process of the work. And I'm modeling. So you should be modeling, instigating, and supporting psychological flexibility in everything you do. If you do that, you'll get high working alliance scores. You'll move people's psychological flexibility more likely than if you didn't. And that means you're more likely, both those things, to get good outcomes. So a process-based vision solves the problem of what do I do to produce, I think, produce the working alliance by um, sort of uh, disentangling it, uh, di you know, uh, dissembling it into its component features at a process level. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, I was very, very comfy with you, Steve. Um, I have we have been useful for our community. I I get goosebumps when I talk to you. So thank you for your time. Um, please, uh, if you want to say something. Thank you so much for my uh, my colleagues. Uh, I know in the Spanish speaking community, it can be a, a barrier to be speaking English. So I apologize because my Spanish is very, very bad. <laughs> uh, even though I've had two Latinx uh, wives, but one's Portuguese, one's Spanish. I can't even keep track. But uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you. And, and to say that uh, the work that's going on there uh, in the Spanish speaking community is among the most important work in evidence-based therapy, in my opinion. And uh, some of the people who've been close to you, Carmen Luciano, people like that are such heroes in bringing a scientific perspective to uh, processes of change. And so uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak to your audience. Well, thank you to you because you are our master. So peace, love, and life. Peace, love, and life. Hacks. Ciao. Ciao.